2016 was an interesting year for video games. Overwatch took over the world upon coming out. We saw the release of games that many people thought would be lost to time forever. FIFA got a story mode. All joking aside, 2016 has been pretty good in the realm of video games, and I've played some really great ones that I am excited to list out. So without further delay, here are the top 10 games I played in 2016. Coming in at number 10, we have Life is Strange, the game about Max Caulfield, your average high school photography student, waking up one day and discovering she now has the power to rewind time, for some reason. The game's plot is made up of the hijinks that she gets herself into in the following week. What I feel this game did really well was being able to create a world that I was interested to exist in and interact with. I quite liked some of the side characters that you get to meet, be it Max's sci-fi nerd friend, or the sweet girl who is undeservedly harassed by the cool kids. Beyond character interactions, the entire time I was playing, I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss in this town. The nature oddities that happened at the end of every episode, the missing persons posters that were plastered everywhere, and some of the more shady characters that you meet all add to a creepy undertone in the game's atmosphere that I really enjoyed. So unfortunately, the problem that prevents this game from ranking any higher is that while most of the game was entertaining enough, the payoff in most of the last episode of the game felt kinda flat for me. Everything in the first four episodes felt like it was building up to something, and then suddenly all that time travel garbage that's in every time travel story comes crashing down on you. The longer episode five went on, the more it felt like it was beginning to lose me. I would say that most of this comes from the fact that the central plot mostly hinges on Max and her interactions with Chloe her best friend. I honestly didn't like her that much, so to constantly have to be rewinding time to help her or play moral compass for her could get kind of old. Disappointing payoff aside, I still enjoyed my time in Arcadia Bay quite a bit and I may even rewind to play it again sometime soon. It's funny how a game centered around a character who can meddle with time manages not to have the most convoluted plot on this list. Bang! Bang! Kingdom Hearts 2 is one of those games that I would point at when I need to explain what a sequel should do. The controls and combat in this game all seem like pretty natural upgrades from the first one. Even some slight nuances like being able to open up treasure chests in the middle of combat and Sora's lack of massive clown shoes feel like they make a world of difference. Action commands are another great addition to the game. Each enemy had something different that you could do to them, and it helps give them a sense of identity. Aside from the normal enemies, we have the boss battles. Oh man, the boss battles. What this game lacks in good writing and likable protagonists, it makes up for with likable villains, or whatever Axel qualifies as, and dazzling boss battles. The Organization 13 bosses were all the joy, except for Demix. The final boss is a classic among video game boss battles, and I'm glad I could finally play it myself. Overall, Kingdom Hearts 2 was a mostly entertaining ride, and who knows, maybe for my list next year, I'll be talking about Kingdom Hearts 3. <laughs> Yoshi's Woolly World is one of the most relaxing games I've played in a while. It takes the cutesy world of Yoshi and gives it an endearing arts and crafts aesthetic. There's a plethora of cool details that this visual style lends itself to. Yoshi can spit out yarn balls to help form a new path of progression. Alternatively, there are these loose threads that you can use to peel away and find a collectible. The collectibles are all cool. There are five yarn capsules in every level, and if you collect all of them, you get a new Yoshi. More importantly than that, I was enjoying the game so much that if I was missing a collectible, I would go back into the level to get it. In terms of difficulty, this game doesn't offer very much challenge, but I don't really think it needs to. The game also has a co-op mode, and I would fully recommend playing with a friend. I think it's better experienced that way. So if you haven't yet checked this game out, go grab a friend and traverse this colorful world together. My love of 
Transistor made me more than happy to take a crack at Supergiant's first game, and oh boy, it did not disappoint. I don't like Bastion quite as much as I like Transistor, but it's still a wonderful game. The gameplay adopts a 3D beat-em-up style and provides quite a bit of quick-paced fun. The weapons that can be obtained throughout the game also provide a nice bit of variety. The environments are really visually interesting. A lot of the world will crumble away or fall into place as you walk. The enemies always change up often enough to prevent them from overstaying their welcome, even if some of them can be kind of annoying. The soundtrack is nothing short of amazing. All of the songs add to the atmosphere, and the vocal tracks really hammer home the drama of the situations in which they are used. Bastion is a wonderful experience that does nothing but increase my affection for developer Supergiant games. Not for nothing, but Pyre is one of my most anticipated games of 2017. Kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Bioshock is one of those classics from the previous console generation that I never really got around to playing. Truth be told, I wasn't all that interested in the game until I heard about the twist. Well, the joke is on me because I seriously missed out. This game has provided me with the most fun I've ever had in a single player FPS game. The power ups and setting managed to draw me in in a way that no modern military shooter has ever managed. My favorite thing about the game has to be the setting. Rapture is this awesome underwater hyper-capitalist metropolis and the atmosphere of this game is top-notch. There were points where I was convinced that this game could have been a horror game if it wanted to be. Rapture's appeal is also helped by audio diaries that are strewn about. It provides a sense of lore to the city that makes it feel like a living, breathing locale. Hearing about the feud between Ryan and Fontaine had nothing to do with helping Atlas, but it certainly was fascinating. Some diaries would feature characters that you don't even meet in the main story and still manage to be interesting. I am extremely pleased that I went back to play this game. It's definitely easy to see why people hold it in such high esteem. Ratchet and Clank is a breath of fresh air. Honestly, in a world that seems to be plastered with either episodic adventure games or giant open-world third-person action games, it's nice to see a new 3D platformer. I've never played a Ratchet game before, but playing this made me nostalgic for the days that I was playing like Banjo and Kazooie or Crash to Insanity. This game is awesome. All of the characters are charming and have unique designs, all the environments are distinct and a joy to explore, the weapons are satisfying to use and rewarding to level up, every once in a while the game throws in change-ups in the gameplay to avoid being repetitive, such as the hoverboard racing or the Clank segments, and shockingly, they don't suck. All in all, Ratchet & Clank provided me with a fun experience in a genre that I didn't even realize I missed, and it's one of the best games on the PlayStation 4. So if you feel disappointed with the games on this console generation, check this game out. It might just be what you're looking for. This indie darling took the internet by storm at the end of 2015. Everywhere I looked, it was Undertale video this, song cover that, theory video here. Well, months after its release, I finally decided to play it, unspoiled by the way, and what did I think of it? It wasn't a bad time. I'll keep the recap brief since chances are you know more than I do. The basic premise is that you take control of a child who has fallen underground into the world of monsters. The goal of your quest is to simply make it back home into the human world, braving whatever dangers the underground holds for you and meeting various colorful characters along the way. The defining feature of this game is the ability to either kill your enemies, as you would in most RPGs, or you can spare them, every enemy. Although some may be more of a chore to show mercy to than others, you don't have to kill anyone. The gameplay also changes it up by giving the usual turn-based RPG combat system a shoot-em-up twist when it's the enemy's turn. The other thing that people really love about this game are the previously mentioned colorful characters. Save for an exception or two, there's something to like about nearly every prominent character you come across. My favorites being Papyrus and Sans. Undertale is a great game that is boosted by unique mechanics, solid writing, and a stellar soundtrack. While it didn't quite stir me to the degree that it did so many others, it's easy to see that there's still plenty of substance that made it a good time. So after about 10 years of waiting, The Last Guardian was finally released in early December. How does it fare against a decade of anticipation? 
Well, I think it's great. The Last Guardian is almost like an inverse of Eco. In Eco, you are guiding and defending the princess. In this game, you rely on Trico for protection and use him to assist you with puzzles. Most people complain about how it can be frustrating to get Trico to do what you want him to do, but I can only really think of one instance where I was beginning to lose my patience. Otherwise, he would respond pretty well in my first try or two. Now, despite playing more like Eco, The Last Guardian still has those moments of grandeur that made Shadow of the Colossus so great. You know, moments like staring down Gaius as he's taking a swing at you, riding on Avion as he flies through the air over that lake, seeing Phalanx emerge from the sand and take flight. All of these moments brought out an inner sense of wonder the first time I experienced them, and The Last Guardian has no shortage of them as well. The game is great visually, too. Well, except for the kid. His model looks kind of like a slightly up PS3 model. Trico, on the other hand, looks amazing, and so do the environments you traverse through. The sense of progression in this game is kind of bizarre. Some of the puzzles would all happen in a single room, others would require quite a bit of traveling to be able to move one obstacle. This doesn't really hurt the game, but along with some of the story beats, it gives me the impression that it was originally going to be shorter. The story is also really nice, the setup is simple yet effective, and there are some really touching moments at the end when the plot really starts to get going. Overall, The Last Guardian was an experience that delivered, and one that I won't be forgetting anytime soon. Quite honestly, this slot could be filled by any of the first three Ace Attorney games that I played over the course of 2016, but I do in fact have a favorite, that being Trials and Tribulations. Playing this series is some of the most fun I've had in video games. The cases are all cleverly mapped out, the puzzles all have great aha moments every time you figure out what it is you need to do, and that aha moment is punctuated by a great soundtrack that only serves to elevate the drama and excitement of the situation. The clever writing serves to make all the cases engaging and every character endearing. Phoenix plays the everyman who calls out the lunacy of the characters around him. Maya is his upbeat, kind of out there sidekick that provides a lot of amusement during the investigation sections. Edgeworth is as suave and charismatic as he is in every other game. My favorite character has to be this game's newest prosecutor, Godot. He brings a lot of entertainment with his mysterious persona, his coffee addiction, love of metaphors, and his overall engaging character arc. These characters help draw me into a world that has provided me with some of my favorite examples of storytelling in video games. Cases 3-4 and 3-5 especially. And Trials and Tribulations as a whole serves as a great conclusion to the arc that has been building over the course of the first three games. Man, if this is how good the first half of the series is, I cannot wait to get to the second half. Squad 7, move out! Man, talk about overlooked classics. Seriously, Valkyria Chronicles is one of those games that I would rarely hear about, but whenever it would come up I would hear nothing but great things about it. With good reason, because this game is incredible. It's a strategy RPG that's set in this kind of fantasy version of World War II. You play taking control of a militia squad to complete the missions you're assigned to. Each unit in your squad is one of five classes that each have their own set of advantages and drawbacks. Scouts, for example, have great movement but are not that great at attacking and don't have that much health. Shock troopers are better options for attacking but can't move quite as well as scouts. Scouts. Lancers are good for taking out tanks but are not the ideal choice when dealing with human threats. Toying around with your squad's roster to see what kind of balance will suit the strategy that you want to employ is really satisfying. The game manages to get progressively more challenging without spiking in difficulty, and it sports a wealth of missions that exist to change from the usual squad on squad combat without feeling too gimmicky. Not only is the gameplay great, but the rest of the game is as equally enjoyable. The cel shaded art style provides a storybook aesthetic that makes the game's graphics nearly ageless. The story and characters of this game manage to stir my emotions in a way that few other games have. The main character, Welkin Gunther, is a nice guy who enjoys nature and dreams of becoming a teacher. He's promoted to squad leader once he joins the militia, and it doesn't take him long to win the loyalty and respect of the soldiers under him. Alicia Melchiod is the squad's second in command, and she acts as the straight man foil to Welkin's outlandish strategy. Strategies. She's also a talented baker. The other characters such as Isara, Rosie, Largo, and Verat, they all have certain humanizing qualities that make them really easy to like. Another reason they are also likable is because their goal is one that's easy to get behind. Gallia, the country that Welkin and friends are from, remained neutral in the European War until the Imperial Army set its sights on Gallia and invaded. All these characters are fighting to defend their home. Doing what they have to do and when the war
war is over, they have goals that they want to accomplish, and I legitimately found myself wanting to see them succeed. It may not be a particularly complex story, but I was invested the whole time, and that coupled with the fact that the gameplay was super engaging, made my time on the Gali in front one of the most enjoyable gaming experiences that I had not just in 2016, but in general. And before long, I'll probably return to this game to see Squad 7 move out yet again.